we are going to work on section 1.1.3 now. One of the complaints I hear when people doing raster analysis, especially if you use it via QGIS, say I tried to run this analysis and I ran out of disk space on my computer. It doesn't make sense. My original raster is about one GB. And when I try to write a raster, it is creating a raster of you know, 500 GB. What happened? The reason is rasters, if you store them uncompressed, they can take up a lot of space. It's a bad idea to use uncompressed rasters like this. You should apply at least a default compression on the data so that you can most efficiently use the disk space that you have. Let's learn about compression, and then we can learn about how best to apply this compression using the GTAL translate command. Let's learn about raster compression. This is a very fascinating topic and something that will be helpful to a lot of you, even if you're working on a small data set or you're processing petabytes of data set. Learning compression and how best to use it will really make a difference on how you process data. Let's learn about raster data storage. So let's say I have this SRTM file that we just work with, right? 3601 cross 3601 pixels. How much storage would I need to store this file on disk? Well, if you just store each pixel value as uncompressed value, you can say I need to store each pixel value, which is type int 16, a 16 bit integer. So you need two bytes to store one pixel value because one byte is eight bits. So if you want to store 16 bits, you need two bytes. It means to store one pixel, I need to consume two bytes of storage space. Totally, I want to store all the bytes in my data. So I say, I have 3601 cross 3601 pixels times two. That's are the number of bytes I want to store. And that means I want to, it'll take 25.93 megabytes. Okay. I can check that. So if I go to my file and say I with this file, I'm going to check how much storage is consuming. It says, oh, it's going to take 25934402. Okay, 25934402. Exactly. That's the file size is stored because that's the uncompressed file size. Each pixel is 16-bit integer, takes two bytes. I have 3601 cross 3601 type pixels. It'll take this many megabytes. This is great. But now, what if you have a raster? encompassing the whole world, it might take gigabytes or petabytes of storage because it's a, you know, if you store everything is uncompressed. So instead of storing them as all the pixels with this original value, we can be a little smarter and say we can apply some compression algorithm to reduce the storage space. This is compression is core to a lot of computer science applications around the world. If you're using internet, if you're using cell phone, everything runs on compression. So there are a lot of technologies that have been invented over time. I'm going to give you an introduction to some of the basic concepts of how compression works. The two main types of compression, lossless, that means you compress the data, when you uncompress it, you get everything back as it was in original. You don't lose any data. So you can reproduce the data with the full fidelity. This is useful where you say, I have this data, I don't want to lose any data by compressing. I want to save this space, but I don't want to lose any information. This is useful for things like elevation, set height imagery, weather data. You don't want to lose any information because there's scientific measurements. You want to preserve that. So if you have scientific data, make sure you use a lossless compression. The name of the algorithms that you might see when you're applying compression is things like deflate or ZSTT or LZW. These are the name of different algorithms for compressing data. And these are all lossless. That means if you use any of those, you will not lose any data. The other compression is lossy. If you take a photo with your cell phone, it's going to save the file as a JPEG file. Right? That's a lossy compression. Because if it stored the full resolution of the image as raw data, you will have a very big file. So instead it says, I will apply some compression. It's okay to lose some information, but I'll get a lot of this storage space. If you use a lossy compression, you can have much higher compression. You can reduce the file size by 10, 20, 100 times. And this is very commonly used when storing photos, even for geospatial data when you're Using aerial or drone imagery, you can use a lossy compression and can tolerate some reduction in the quality, but again, you have a big storage, big reduction in the storage space. JPEG 2000 or JPEG is very commonly used algorithm for doing lossy compression. There's a newer algorithm called WebP. This was invented by Google. WebP can be used for both lossy and lossless compression. Vida supports this. This is, they claim it can further reduce storage by 30% compared to JPEG with the same quality. So again, if you work with large data, WebP can help you save a lot of space. So how does compression work? What's this magic? Let's take a simple example. I want to store pixel values that look like this, 100, 101, 102, 100, and 100. I can store all of this and say, I will 
store all of them as five different values. And I'll take two bytes for each of those values. And I'll have five times the amount of storage space I can take. But I can be a little smarter and say, I don't need to store all the values. I just need to know where are those values and how many times they repeat. So I can instead say, I will store 100 and I'll not store it three times. I'll just say 100 occurs in the position 0, 4, and 5. I'll say 101 occurs at index 1, 102 occurs at 2. I'll store only that. And now I can recreate the input with the full fidelity. I'll just say, wherever I see this index, replace it with 100. Wherever I see those, replace it with 101. One. Imagine you had a million pixels with the same value. Instead of storing them a million times, you can say, oh, I have this one value. It repeats a million times. You store that. And now you have saved sort data. So many times when writing raster data, you have data set which encompasses the whole world, but the data is there only in a small region of the world. So if you save that uncompressed, you'll be saving no data values all throughout the empty space. Instead, you can just say all of those values are no data and only you have the valid data here. And you save that, you result in lossless compression. This is a very simplistic example of how this works, but again, you get an idea how this algorithm optimizes your data storage and they are able to store this information in a much more compact way. Let's see how this works in GDAL. So we're going to open the GDAL documentation for GeoTIFF format. GDAL has this documentation for each of the data formats that it supports. GeoTIFF is the most commonly, most widely used data format. It's got a lot of powerful support for compression. And I would recommend using this because it's completely open source and it's got very wide support across different software. So if you come here, you'll see a lot of this documentation around what the format supports, et cetera. Let's use this. So I want to apply some compression to this file. I would have to check the documentation for the particular data format that I'm using. So I'm on the GeoTIFF file here. There are some options here. So there are some creation options and it says compress. It suppose this many different types of compression. The default value is none. So if you just run GDAR translate input output, the default is no compression, but you can set this option compress to any of this. So you can do JPEG compression, LZW, deflate, whatever. And all of these are documented with all the caveats that they have. These are known as the creation options. So when you're creating a file, we need to specify those options. In the GDAL translate command, you can see I have GDAL translate input output, and then there's this option dash CO. Dash CO stands for creation options. So while you're creating the file, specify some extra options. Let's see how to specify those. So I had done this. Remember my output file size was 100 megabytes uncompressed. Let's apply some compression. I'll use dash CO creation options. I'm going to give option compress equal to deflate. There's no space between this equal to. So say dash CO space, and this is one creation option. And I say, use the deflate compression algorithm on this data. This options can be anywhere on the command. You can do GDAL translate, dash CO, compress deflate, merge VRT, merge diff, or it can be the end. So it doesn't matter where they are. So let's run this. I'm just going to run this. And let's go and see what happened. My file size reduced to 75 megabytes. So I saved 25% of storage space by applying this deflate compression algorithm. I didn't lose any data. If I open the file in QGIS or ArcGIS or Python, the pixel values will remain the same. All of those software use GDAL to read it. GDAL understands how to uncompress this data and read the actual values. So by applying this one option, you were able to save 25% of storage space. You will notice that when you run the compression, it takes slightly longer to create the output. Right? When you're just doing uncompressed output, it goes faster. When you apply this compression, your machine has to do a little bit more work to compute this compression dictionary and store that. And so it takes an additional computation to compress the file. And same happens with decompression. If you read this data, which is uncompressed, it'll be faster. When you read the compressed data, first it has to be decompressed and then read it. So there'll be slight extra overhead of computation. At the very least, you should use one of these compressions. I prefer deflate or LZW. There's a, a both good algorithms. Never create uncompressed geotip ever again in your life. There's no real benefit of storing so many pixel values as uncompressed. The extra overhead that you get for compression time spent is well worth it. You'll typically see 25, 30 to even 100 times saving your compression. It depends on the data. If you have just 
but also with you know same values throughout, you'll just see it compressed like 99% because it doesn't just store everything, it just store only the data that is not relevant. Now we learned about one compression. Let's see if we can improve. Let's can we do better? Can we choose a different algorithm or can we apply some additional options? So when we're working with this LZW deflate or ZSTD, they support one more parameter called predictor. So we have this option, which allows you to compress the files even better. Predictor is a way to say, I will not store the whole value. I'll show, store only the difference from the previous value to the current value. Let's see an example. So you want to store these values. Remember, we use this example, 100, 101, 100, 200, 100. Instead of storing these values, if you use a predictor, let's say you use a predictor 2, which is horizontal differencing. You'll say, I will store first value. The next value, I'll store it as 1, because it's 100 plus 1. Second value, I'll store it as 2, because it's 100 plus 2. So instead of storing all the pixel values, I'll just store the first pixel, and then the difference from the first pixel to the other pixel. And this means I can store much smaller values, and that will reduce the amount of storage I consume. This is called the predictor. If you use any of these algorithms, you can specify the predictors. By default, there's no predictor used. So we can say, oh, use this predictor. If your data has integer values, like we have integer values of elevation, use predictor two, which works better for integers. If you have floating point data, if you have satellite data, where you have reflectance values, you have 0.13 or some other values, use three, which is a floating point predictor, which works better with that. So. We we'll, can specify that as one of the creation options. There's another option in compression which is very useful called highly. Now think about you have this raster data. How do you store them on disk? You want to store them in some memory, right? You have your hard drive, and hard drive has some space where you to store it. By default, it'll say I have this file. I'll store one line in sequence of memory spaces. Then I'll store the second line. Then I'll store the third line, and so on. So if you think about a hard drive. The hard drive has some empty slots. It's going to store all the values of the first line first, then the second line, and the third line, and so on. That's the default. Think about how the raster data is accessed. When you load some raster data, you typically are looking at a region of the raster, right? You say, I want to look at this region. I want to get the stats of this within this polygon. You typically, if you want the stats of this polygon, you have to read all the lines from the disk. You say, I want to read each line. I have to decompress those, and then I can get the values. So for a lot of the spatial analysis where the data is more spatially autocorrelated, it makes sense to store the data in blocks rather than lines. So there's another option where GDAL says, I will store the data. I'll divide your image into small tiles, store one tile together in the disk, then the next tile, and so on. So when you want to view one tile, I can just get them from the memory and decompress that instead of doing line by line. Most of the geospatial data will benefit from this tiling scheme versus the line by line scheme because geospatial data has a spatial autocorrelation. Most of the data that is close by is very much similar. So your, your predictor will work better, your compression will really perform better. So there's one more creation option called tiled yes. You say yes, I want the tiled geotiff. So if you do this, you'll be stored in these chunks of 256 by 256 pixels. Again, it's all hidden from you. You'll just get a geotiff file. But the software that's reading it will know that this is a tiling scheme. It will use that, and you'll suddenly have less storage space versus less data transfer screen. You can see there are some creation options. We'll say tile, yes. So we'll say use tile, yes. And we want to also use the predictor, predictor two, because it's a integer data. So let's update our command line. We had this command line. I'm going to add some creation options. I'll say creation option, tile equals yes. Another creation option, predictor equal to two. The full command is given to you here. So make sure you copy this. When you have a long command line, you can break it into multiple lines. In Windows, you can use this caret character. This is just a line continuation. On Linux, you can have this backslash. So when you copy paste this, it'll just run as a single line, but you know you can kind of write it in multiple lines like this. So you can try this. Tile yes, predictor two. Right now we are at 75 megabyte size, just by adding this to compression option, let's see what happens. So now we'll create this merge.tiff file with a deflate compression option, but with the internal tiling and with a two predictor two. Look at that, I have 40 megabyte of storage space. So suddenly I was able to compress this data much better, same data, lossless, everything is there. It's just that now I'm able to save 60 megabytes of storage space, 60% compression. Okay, we learned about the basics of compression. I want to 
to say that compression is great, but there is some cost associated with it. Just be aware of that. And you compress the data, it'll take more CPU to apply the compression because you're doing more computation. When you have compressed data and you want to read it, the software has to decompress it first. If you use tiling scheme like this, it'll only decompress it tile by tile as you read it, but it'll still take some time and CPU cost. For most applications, unless you're doing something very mission critical, the additional cost of CPU and time are far outweighed by the space that you save. So again, in my experience, you should always apply compression, but just be aware that there is an additional CPU and time cost to compression. And sometimes a highly compressed data, if you do some JPEG compression data with highly compressed, if you load it in the software, it might take a while for it to load because it's decompressing the data in the background.